Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station. Middle Path Radio. Download our app for the iPhone and Android to listen live. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, tonight we have a very important and hopefully enlightening show for you with our special guest who is an expert in economics and author of the book Gold Standard, The Future for a Global, for a Stable Global Currency. Wow, got that right. Uh, before I introduce our guests, let me start by introducing the subject, inshallah. Our discussion tonight is understanding, understanding how money works. Um, for myself, it is a topic that I find very difficult to digest and often leave it, to, uh, uh, leave it for the economists or the academics. Uh, as it goes over my head. Um, I'm sure many people would agree with me on this subject. Um, so tonight, I really want to make this subject bite-sized and simple to understand. Uh, we will try and cover, if time permits, um, how money works, all the jargons used for, uh, to confuse us, like recession, quantitative easing, fractional reserves, boom and bust, the, the capitalist system and the alternative to this model. So stay tuned. Um, and engage with us, inshallah. Our number is, as usual, 0747708248, or you can tweet us at Middle Path Radio with your question and comments, uh, inshallah. Um, we have also launched our apps, uh, which is on Google Play and App Store, so make sure you download and listen to this show, inshallah. Uh, let me introduce our guest um, and our special guest for tonight. Uh, we have Brother Jamal Harwood, who is an economist and have uh, extensively uh, written articles, journals, and international speaker, uh, and the author of the book, uh, Gold Standard, The Future for a Stable Global Currency, um, another book, uh, Solving Global Poverty, and his famous book, uh, Faith <laughs> and Progress, uh, inshallah. So you can buy uh, some of these books online, or you can download them as a PDF. So in inshallah, please do so. Please check it out. Um, also, um, last but uh, not least, uh, our regular contributor to this show, Brother Shahadat Uddin, who is also very clued up with this subject. Um, very fortunate to have the brothers uh, in the studio tonight to discuss this very important topic. Uh, so, Assalamu alaikum, brothers, and welcome to the show. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, so, let me start with uh, Brother Jamal. Um, in a simple term, can you please explain to us uh, what is this concept of money, how it works, and how it ca came about, or how it comes about? Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, money's been around for as long as humans have been around. Uh, it simply, we used to have uh, trade or we used to have barter. Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody was a farmer and he was, uh, you know, farming for corn. Okay. And somebody else was a builder. So he'd be a builder. So the, the guy with the corn would maybe trade corn for the builder to come and do some building work for him. Mm -hmm. So that was like a barter, an exchange, which is perfectly okay, but it, it's not very efficient. Because what, what if the builder has enough corn and he doesn't yeah. want corn, he wants something else? Mm -hmm. Or what if the guy selling his corn doesn't need a builder? You know, mm -hmm. he needs to go see a doctor, he, ne he needs something else. So, so to make trade easier between people, um, we have the concept of a medium of exchange or money. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that if you have something valuable uh, which is recognized by everybody and is in good units, you know, meaning is like uh, fungible, you know, can be divided into small units for, for buying chewing gum mm -hmm. or can be used in big units for buying a house, okay. um, then you'll use that. And it just makes trade that much easier. So, but the key is, is that you've got to have something which is valuable, which everyone recognizes and are happy to trade with. But was uh, it like a know, receipt at the, in the beginning or... No, I think I think what happened uh, in early days is that uh, the the people the, in the society where they would see things of value. I mean, you look at some primitive societies; mm -hmm. uh, they would trade in things like cow dung, you know, because cow dung was <laughs> was recognized mm. and it was something which 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 they needed as a form of manure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I don't think you get away with it today, but but it, you know, fair enough. In in that society, you know, people would try. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> you could give it a try, you know. Wouldn't be a but uh, but historically, the the key over thousands of years has been gold and silver. You know, mm -hmm. because they have value, everyone recognizes it, 
Uh, they've got a lot of use, jewelry, industrial, etc. And um, most importantly, they keep their value. You know, if you mm. look at gold, silver, over hundreds, thousands of years, you know, you can see that they keep a very stable value. Okay, that's cool. Uh, but the Shahadat, you yeah, want to I mean, add anything to this? I think just to briefly add to what Jamal said, I think he's covered it um, pretty comprehensively. Uh, th- the main thing is that ultimately when you engage in trade, you want... Um, two items of commensurate value, of mm. equal value. And this was the importance of having, um, you know, a, a metallic-based s- standard because ultimately gold and silver, as we know, has intrinsic value. It's, it's yeah. something that has has worth itself. So when you're trading uh, for other items, you're, it's a fair trade. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And the other important thing to note as well, that um, the, the role of money specifically within an economy is to mm-hmm. service the economy, it's to facilitate trade, to make trade easier mm-hmm. so it's important that the economy itself is never subservient to the to the money system but rather it's the other way around so that ultimately money is purely there for the purposes of facilitating trade and, and, uh, and okay commerce. so so many people switch off and find it difficult to understand uh, um, when we hear economic terms uh, such as quantitative easing fr- uh, fractional reserve banking um, hostility and different terms used for money, uh, many other common jargons used. I would like you to explain these terms in a simplified form so our listeners can understand uh, and understand this discussion. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, just before I talk about quantitative easing, um, let's just explain another point, which is that um, since 1971, up until 1971, we've had money which was backed by gold. Mm-hmm. Okay, there were periods of time, usually around wartime, World War II, World War I, when countries suspended the gold standard because, you know, they, countries didn't trust each other. So you mm-hmm. couldn't actually ship gold between them. Uh, but after World War II at Bretton Woods, they agreed that the dollar, the U.S. dollar, would be the main currency that people would use. And to give the, the dollar um, credibility, it would be backed by gold, meaning that the American government promise that for every $35, they would give one ounce of gold. Okay. So that's like a gold-backed currency. Mm-hmm. Then all the other countries, Britain, you know, throughout Europe, etc., agreed to make their currency relative to the dollar. So you would get $2 equals one pound, for example. Mm-hmm. And, and that way, people had stability and they had a currency, although it was... Uh, a paper money, it was a mm-hmm. fiat money, like yeah. the dollar, mm-hmm. it was backed by gold. Now, 1971, the so, Americans... Sorry, I'm yeah. going to quickly uh, yeah. uh, interrupt you here. When you mean by backed by gold, yeah. what do you mean? What I mean is that in, in because earlier, they're printing in a lot of earlier money. days, in yeah. earlier days, people would actually have gold coins, you know, mm-hmm. gold and mm-hmm. silver mm-hmm. coins. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then in time, people started to issue paper based okay. money. But again, the paper money was bit backed by gold, meaning that there was gold in a vault and somebody would issue a, a, a pound, you know, a pound note, which would be backed by gold. So if I, if I was to US take my $100, pound, $100 I yeah. should get my gold. That's right. Yeah. You could get your gold. You could okay. you have gold. So, so again, it was as good as gold. Everyone said this dollar is as good as gold. <laughs> you know? Now, what happened in, in the 60s was the Americans started abusing this position that they were in where, 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 where everyone was using the dollar. Mm. So they were funding wars, like they were funding the Vietnamese war throughout the 1960s. So the amount of dollars that they issued was much, much more than the amount of gold that they were holding. Mm-hmm. And the European powers, the French, the Germans and others, they called them to task. And what they did was went to the Americans and said, listen, we're going to take gold you know we're going to give you some of your cheap dollars and we mm-hmm. want you to give us gold mm-hmm. so the american gold reserves went from 21,000 tons down to about 8,000 tons wow. and it was rapidly disappearing mm-hmm. so the americans under nixon they said right we're going to cut it off we're going to cut off the the, the gold backing of, of the dollar and uh, all these currencies are going to be free floating which which means that all the currencies in the world, the dollar, the pound, the Deutschmark, the French franc, the rest of them, would all be traded against each other and find their own value. But none of them would be backed by gold or silver, which meant that they were fiat, paper-based money with no backing. Now, of course, the problem with that is that if you're a country like Zimbabwe Mm -hmm. uh, or Bangladesh or Mm -hmm. Pakistan or Turkey, you know, the governments would print as much 
notes as they like, yep. and then the value of those notes would go down. You know, so this is we see monetary inflation when there's yep. too many notes in circulation. Now, what one thing is that you mentioned the word austerity. Let's just explain austerity. Now, yeah, I've got a couple of words here. Gov- governments governments yeah. have to balance their their books. So mm-hmm. you've got money coming in from taxation, sale of assets, and so on, and then you've got expenditure so they spend money on nhs they spend money on on roads on on military on public servants Mm -hmm. all this type of stuff so governments will have a budget every year and if there's a shortfall that's known as a deficit and that deficit would usually be funded by them issuing a bond which is called a gilt so that's a government security in this country in the u.s what's a bond bond, (laughs) bond, bond. yeah yeah no that's fine a bond is like you issue a promise uh, that if somebody lends you money, mm-hmm. you're going to pay them interest on that money every year for 10 years or okay. 20 years. Okay. And then at the end of that period of the bond, 10 years or 20 years or whatever, you will pay them back the full amount. So let's say you give a one billion pound bond or guilt mm-hmm. um, and, and it's at 5%. Mm-hmm. You know? So you promise the person who gives you money that buys the bond that you're going to pay them 5% per annum and at the end of the 10 years you're going to pay the whole amount back so this is how they would fund a deficit so that works as long as people are prepared to buy their bonds prepared to keep buying it now in recent times after recent financial crisis it's been much harder for people to fund them so they started to do a accounting trick called quantitative easing quantitative easing meant that they would be issuing bonds and buying bonds, meaning the central bank, the central uh, bankers would buy bonds of of companies, of others, and would also be buying their own bonds. So that's effectively a way to... When they buy these bonds, do they get the the interest that was attached to that bond? Well, they did, they would, but the thing, the, the, the accounting trick is that they're buying it by creating new money. Right. Uh-huh. So if you got paper based money, you didn't just create new money to buy something with it. So you right? can just print money. Yeah. Okay. So if you imagine you're sitting at home with a photocopier and you say, right, you know, I've only got 20 pounds. Let me put the 20 pounds into the photocopier. I mean, don't do this at home. But if yeah. you printed it off and print off another, another, you know, five pages of 20s, you yeah. know, then you've got a lot more money. It's obviously not that simple. But if you're the central bank and you can go ahead and start printing money to buy up your own bonds, you're doing the same thing. So you're putting more and more money into circulation and that is going to cause inflation. So this is what they've been doing recent years is that they've been doing this quantitative easing. They give a big fancy name for it, but yeah. it effectively means it's like printing more money. So you talked so, about inflation, but what does yeah. that do to the currency? I mean, does it, does yeah. it mean that, that 10 well, pounds is worth... If you, have, if you have a certain amount of goods and services in your economy, mm-hmm. your economy is a certain level. Now, if the amount of money matching that is similar, uh, meaning that the amount of money which is circulating in relation to what people are buying and the services that they're they're providing, then you've got a sort of an equilibrium and and you don't have a particular problem. If things are growing, then you would see a a sort of a a growth in the money supply. Mm -hmm. But when governments start printing a lot more money, meaning that there's a big deficit and they start printing a lot more money, it means that there's more money chasing the same amount of goods and services and that causes inflation meaning that the value of that money goes down Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and everyone will recognize that because you know let's let's look at the u.s since 1971 gold was 35 dollars an ounce at 1971 today it's about 1350 dollars an ounce so that doesn't mean that gold has gone up in value. What it means is that the dollar has gone down in value mm-hmm. dramatically. You know, so that's because they print so many more dollars every year. So anyway, just one point about this austerity. Um, if governments want to balance their books, meaning balance their budget, yep. one way to do that is quantitative easing, printing more money, but it will hit the currency, the value yep. of, the, of the pound. Another way to do that is to um, go to your public and say, we're going to cut back on spending. Mm -hmm. And when you cut back on spending, you're cutting back on spending on usually the poor, social welfare Mm -hmm. uh, services. And that's what the the conservative government have been doing. They've been cutting back 
on NHS spending. They've been, uh, although they say they haven't, it's it's not not being maintained at the level it used to be or it needs to be done. Uh, they've been cutting back on other essential services and the welfare budget. So a lot of the, the welfare um, benefits have, have, have been cut. Mm-hmm. So that's what aus- austerity is. It's basically trying to balance the budget. It should be, if you're going to try and balance the budget, it should be dealt with fairly across society, well, meaning that those that are wealthier would pay also, more yeah. than mm-hmm. those that are poorer. But it seems to be the other way around. The wealthier are paying less and the poor are paying more. What, one more thing, fractional reserve banking. What, what What's that? Fractional reserve banking, it means that it people think that when you put your money into the bank, that the bank will lend that out. Okay, so that, yeah. that happens. So mm. let's say you put a thousand pounds into the bank. Yeah. You then probably think, oh, okay, the bank's got a thousand pounds it can lend to somebody, give them mm-hmm. a personal loan, or it could be part of a, a mortgage that they give to somebody. What happens is the government puts a limit, which might be 10%, mm-hmm. or it might be 5%, or it might be 2%. And that means that the bank, okay, so it, it, if, if somebody puts a thousand pounds in, it means if there's a 10% fractional limit, the bank ten, ish, can issue a loan of 10,000 pounds, right? Mm-hmm. So where did they get the other 9,000 pounds from? Again, it very comes. simple, they just created it. They, they printed more money. So you go out and they print more money, and then you've got a loan going out at £10,000. And then the bank will charge interest on that. Maybe they charge 8%, 9%, mm-hmm. you know, personal loan, 10%, maybe 15%. And then they, they earn that money five years, six years, seven years, whatever it is. And then the loan is repaid. When the loan is repaid, at that point, that money is retired. Okay, so that created money is knocked off the books okay. but for all that period of time the bank has created money out of nothing out of thin air that's right that's right so the fractional reserve means all they ever had was a thousand pounds going in at the beginning and then they created nine thousand and lent out ten thousand you see so it's mm. easy easy money for these banks to do that sort of stuff it's very corrupt you know, mm. and, why, and, and why do they do that? I mean, well, well because, there must be you know, an if, advantage if or disadvantage. You, if I could tell you that you could create nine thousand pounds out of nothing, mm-hmm. and then you could lend it to somebody, and then that, that charge that person interest at ten percent, fifteen percent, you'd be making a lot of money on interest. Mm. And not only that, if you give it out as a mortgage and the guy doesn't pay his mortgage, then you, you can turn around and take his take house, his house yeah. take his house from him. So, so this is very easy money for these banks. Uh, Shadow wants to come in. Go on, go yeah. On. So just just to really add to um, what Jamal said, I think with fractional reserve banking, there's really a fundamental principle under that that sort of um, props it all up, which is that fundamentally in order for money to exist in society you yeah. have to have debt yeah this is what it this is what it boils down to so i think we, we spoke about quantitative easing a quantitative easing printing uh, money printing money okay. which literally all that happens is you have the government which issues a bond which is basically it's just an iou it's a document which says right oh, we're well, going to country, borrow yeah. x amounts of money from the central bank at this rate of interest for this period of time five ten years however long it is and there's there's an exchange that takes place where you know the central bank will then hand over uh, will then hand over say a billion pounds and mm-hmm. in in exchange the central bank will receive the iou um, and even so that's that's known as base money so whatever money that the central bank creates is mm-hmm. is base money you then have money which is known as broad money which is exclusively created by the commercial banks the the retail banks so what they do in effect in the fractional reserve the small bank, banks you mean yeah just high street banks okay. so the likes of hsbc barclays or pretty much the the the, the banks that we sort we of use, we yeah. use so what happens is that um the the high street banks are also able to create broad money, uh, but ultimately in the fractional reserve banking system, they take their lead from the central bank. So the amount of broad mo- the amount of base money that exists within the system would determine the amount of broad money that that the that the high street banks can can create. But fundamentally, um, the money itself it can only enter into the economy when it's lent in. Okay. There's no other way. So either the government borrows the money, either corporations the borrow, borrow the money, or the oh. public bro- borrow the money. It can't enter into the economy in, in any new, in any other so way. So it's the interest that comes in. Is is that what you say? No. Yeah. So so, in effect, it's it's a way of ensuring. So when you borrow money, obviously, you you know the interest is charged, and this is something that is created. 
Yeah, so yeah. so the, the 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 point being that a modern economy cannot function without money. That mm. that's the bottom line. Mm. But the only way that money can come into existence is if you if you borrow the money into existence. So that basically ensures that private banks will always have leverage over the state, over corporations, over households because they can't sort of uh, exist without them because they are the ones that have a monopoly over over the money supply so okay. that's the key principle to bear in mind in in all of this okay fantastic let me I want, I want you guys to briefly explain the capitalist banking system but before you do that you know we have had many recessions um uh, why and how does it happen yeah why do banks need bailing out and why do public have to bail them out um it feels like uh, we have been cheated uh, by the banks are we being uh, exploited and i want you to talk about the cap- uh, the capitalist system and uh, the recession process yeah uh, i think I mean, that's if, one if of I the questions that we've actually had is that you you in capitalism you tend to have these cycles and they often come every probably 8 to 10 years 2009 we had one yeah then. 2008 so we're probably due one but but the point is <laughs> in fact i don't i don't think we i don't think we've really recovered since 2008 mm. Um, because I think a lot of what they do now is they kind of massage the figures and, and, mm-hmm. they're, and they're presenting figures which are not necessarily accurate. Anyway, the point is, is that it tends to go in cycles. So you see uh, what the people call boom-bust cycles. So you've got an up cycle in which the economy is expanding, you know, there's more business going on, and mm-hmm. people are trading more, money is circulating more, there's, there's, there's more debt, yep. meaning that people are issuing people more. People are buying lo- houses, mortgages. Yeah, people mortgages. are pe- taking out mortgages, they're taking yep. out loans, they're, they're yep. expanding their business and so on. So everyone feels good. Yep. and positive but it get re, it sort of loses momentum mm-hmm. and slows down and there's and there comes a tipping point when people are not you know it's kind of saturated they're not taking out more debt mm-hmm. and and businesses start to contract and maybe they don't do so well and at that point often they then get hit by banks wanting to take back those loans because banks become worried that businesses will go under so they want to close down those loans they want to take back the money and that causes a contraction and that will t- t- usually cause the the economy to go into recession so businesses slow down they're not trading as much they're not so trading does it, as much. does it does it really affect the business first because we know recently BHS is is going down yeah is, no yeah. no there's a lot there's a lot of businesses going down um so does it start it, with the businesses and then maybe well it You, you can look at it different ways. I mean, yeah. it, it, you can look from the banking point of view in, in the fact that the banks become concerned by too much debt being out there and mm-hmm. not being repaid. You know, so the ability of people to pay back debt, you see consumers getting into problems with their credit cards. Yeah. You see people being overextended with their house mortgages. Mm-hmm. You see people losing their jobs, you know, because there's not enough jobs being created in the economy. These things can cause these sorts of problems which will then start building momentum to turn into a recession. Now, a recession <clears throat> is defined as two consecutive quarters in which the economy doesn't grow in which there's negative growth in GDP. That, so you need to so, explain that to me. Okay, what it means is that people <laughs> record how much GDP is, mm-hmm. okay? Gross domestic product or gross national product. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's simply it's the amount of goods and services in the economy. Okay. So the amount of business trade etc which is going on in the economy, it's a convenient measure for that. Now, if it's contracting, it means that figures going down. Yeah. And if that goes down for two consecutive quarters, that's defined as a recession, right? So that might last a year, it may last two years, it may last three years. It may go into depression, which means it might be several years in which mm-hmm. it's contracting. Now that causes another problem because when that happens, people aren't paying back their loans. People mm-hmm. aren't paying back the debt. So peop- bank- banks are debt. losing money. And mm-hmm. not only that, the, the value... of money in circulation can also become less cause deflation in mm-hmm. which case governments will have problems because people will not be paying as much taxation so governments cannot spend as much and it creates this vicious cycle uh, people lose their jobs they become very unhappy the government can't pay there's more austerity they cut back on services they cut back on on welfare and so on and so forth so this is a a, a big negative but it happens every every 8 or 10 years mm-hmm. so this is one of the 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 problems of capitalism 
And, and a lot of it is down to this banking system of creating money on interest, which is forever growing and creating more and more of a problem. I mean, in the last 10 years, we've, we've had, you know, another 50% increase in the amount of debt in the world. Yeah. You know, and you would expect that there would be a sort of reigning back in the amount of debt because 2008, there was a, a debt crisis. There was a financial crisis. The banking system nearly collapsed yeah. because that recession was a, was a big problem. A lot of the banks uh, collapsed as well. Well, they, they were about yeah. to collapse, but the governments bailed them out. The governments came along and said, listen, we'll give you a loan or we'll buy shares in your company and in, in your bank and then we'll keep you afloat. But they, they wrote them an open check. I mean, they put hundreds of billions of pounds, if not trillions of dollars in mm -hmm. the U.S., certainly mm -hmm. trillions in the U.S. and hundreds of billions in the U.K. And, and they're still supporting it. The Royal Bank um, of Scotland you know, you talk about bailing it out. How, yeah. how did we pay for it? I mean, the, the, uh, the bailout means that the government promised to pay, and they did pay, again, out of public money to the bank to support the bank. Now, the reason that that means the public bailed it out is because the public fund the government. Mm -hmm. We fund the government via taxation. Mm -hmm. So effectively, the, the British tax um, demands yeah. have gone up by the amount of these bailouts, unless we're repaid. Now, some of it has been repaid, but a lot of it hasn't. So effectively, that becomes like a deficit for the... For Sh the Shahadat, yeah. you <laughs> tell me to come in, go, yeah. on, go for it. Sorry. <laughs> you can come in. You know, uh, I, I, I know Jamal's got a lot to say, <laughs> but um, please do come in. Yeah. No problem. I, th I think what it might be useful is if we sort of just uh, simplify the, the whole banking process. But please do, um, yeah. I mean, this is so, the whole... So that yeah. people actually appreciate the impact that it has mm. um, within within the economy itself. Now, I want, to imagine, I want you to imagine... I want you to talk about recession and the capitalist bank. System Absolutely. That's one thing that confuses me. Sure. <laughs> so, so, so what I want you to do, I want you to imagine I'm a bank. Yeah. Okay. And you're a customer. Now you're going to borrow money from me mm -hmm. in order to maybe purchase a house. So you yeah. come to me, you, you borrow, let's say, three hundred thousand pounds. Now, what I have to do in order to create that money is simply key in a couple of numbers into a computer. That that's Which is quite easy to that's do. That's it. Yeah. That's all I have to do. And by keying in a couple of numbers into a computer, what I do, I make two entries. One is a loan entry. Mm -hmm. which is money that you're, you're you borrowing. owe me. Yeah. And the other side of that, which is basically a, an entry into your deposit account. So this is where the money that you can then utilize to, 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 to purchase your house. Mm -hmm. Now, after I've lent you the money, as a banker, that's pretty much my job done in the economy. I so I I'm just paying you back. Yeah, so I can go away. Literally, if, if we say the, the agreed interest rate is, um, let's say, 10%, yeah? So that's £30,000 that you've got to pay each year for a period of let's say 20 years yeah mm -hmm. now as a banker i can literally i can now go away at this point i can go maybe hit 18 rounds of golf i can go on holiday mm -hmm. i can i can maybe go and do some Take a bonus. i can i can pretty much do what I, whatever i want i can mm -hmm. live a life of luxury because you know why because i know at the end of the year you owe me 30000 pounds mm -hmm. right in interest now what's what's even though you're paying me back in kind, so you're mm -hmm. going to be paying me back in pounds sterling, there's fundamentally a difference between our transactions. And that, that difference is the, the effort exerted, right? So when I had to create that money, all I did was key in a couple of numbers. Yeah. What did you have to do to earn the £30,000? I, I, I have to now uh, get a second job maybe or do long hours maybe cut down do you know what um I've, uh, we've got so many questions but i just want you to finish so yep. i can i can read those out. okay so so that's that's the point the difference is the effort exerted so the effort you've had to exert is far greater than what so I've the had general to exert. public is working far exactly harder than the, the the bankers exactly this is the point bankers but, but not only that the bankers take that money and uh, they then decide that what to do with that money because a lot of the other money, if they're not lending money, they, they could actually take money, your deposit money, for example, mm -hmm. and gamble it on the stock market or gamble it on the derivatives market. You know, and that's what a lot of the co problems that they created in 2008 is that they, they, they got they out of... a lot of bonds. They got, uh, yeah, that well, they created a lot of complex uh, things which were related to the U.S. housing market mm. under the belief that the housing market would never go down. Mm. And sure enough, in 2007, 2008, the housing market crashed. Mm -hmm. And that caused a crash on all these other financial products and caused a crash 
in into their the, the banks themselves. So, mm-hmm. so you know, they're they're a law unto themselves. These banks mm. in, in in general. So. Okay. Okay, let me let me qu- uh, quickly uh, maybe uh, take some uh, text that we received. But before I do that, please uh, ring in, or you can uh, send us text. Uh, you can go online to Twitter uh, and you know send uh, send your comments or questions today or tonight. Sorry, tonight we are discussing um, the banking system, um, understanding money. Uh, how does it work? So please ring in. Our number is zero seven four seven seven zero eight zero two four eight. Let me read out some texts. Uh, I've got so many texts here, so um, uh, some uh, may be, uh, uh, might be relevant, but um, I'll just go through some of them, and uh, then if, if you brothers want to uh, pick those out and maybe discuss. Uh, how can you persuade the common folk about the seat of capitalist monetary system? That's the first one. There is no doubt that there are some think tanks amongst the Western academics who don't believe in this current monetary system, but their views are marginalized. Uh, can these people viewed as promoting aggressively? Um, uh, most would argue that these are conspiracy theorists. Uh, what can we do to counter such argument? Uh, the, another one, hasn't the banking system done wonders for the masses in the sense more and more people are able to own properties, uh, going on holidays, and small businesses are able to develop and expand? Um, uh, I'll, I'll take a couple more. All of us need the banks, and if they fail, would that not create a nightmare scenario? Um, how can the common people protect protect? against this massive fraud and is there a way to undermine this system effectively uh there's a lot of questions mm. um text <laughs> yeah so. there's a lot of good points there really mm. and, and and it's interesting because it's, it's sort of 50 50 between those which are positive about mm. banking and those which are negative and i can uh, can assure you that if you lose your job and then you and then the bank comes knocking on your door and, and says i'm going to call in your mortgage mm-hmm. and i'm going to take your house and make you out on the street homeless you're not going to be very happy about it i mean but it gets back to what shahadat was saying earlier is that they're earning this interest and i look mm. at interest as obviously as a muslim interest is haram yeah meaning that you can't create because when in islam um money is gold and silver mm-hmm. so you can't create extra gold just by like slapping thin air, yeah. yeah you can't create extra gold by just slapping on a title that says ah five percent interest mm-hmm. you know because mm-hmm. you can't you know create another five percent of gold out of nothing yeah. Obviously, a gold miner could be under the ground digging up gold, but that's another matter. Mm-hmm. But the issue of just saying, I expect another 5% of money uh, be, be, because I'm a bank, you know, for, for sitting there doing a few digits uh, mm-hmm. on, on a computer screen is absurd. But it, it's like a form of extra tax. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. those of your, your, your listeners who have said, you yeah, know, aren't banks important? Don't they do a good service? Yep. You can go on holiday. We you can, rely you can on take them. a loan and all this type of stuff. Look, you you need somewhere to have a safekeeping, right? Yeah. So if you have a, you need somewhere maybe to provide a checking service, mm-hmm. you know, a service in terms of, you know, that if you're paying bills, you know, how, how they're going to be cleared, this type of stuff. Now, that's a relatively simple, straightforward one. Mm-hmm. But the notion that banks are going to be able to charge interest and create money out of nothing most people don't understand that they don't actually understand what they're doing until it hits them what about and small uh, small businesses know. i mean uh, one of the texts said look well, you know, no, small I businesses mean, they I say, rely uh, on loans again again the point uh, uh, the totally different view that islam has on this is important and that is that we have a, a situation whereby we work in partnership with people so you need to st- st- set up a new business. You need funding. You don't go to a bank in Islam. What you mm. do is you go to the neighborhood. You go to friends. You go to family. You, you might go to somebody, an intermediary, who knows somebody else who's got money. Mm-hmm. So you set up partnerships, Mudaraba, Mufawada, and Anan, Waji, you know, different types of company structures. I'm, I'm going to come into with, that. With, I do with, want with, to discuss Whereby these. people are sharing the risk. Yeah. In a bank loan situation, they write a document where the bank doesn't share any risk. Mm-hmm. If your business fails, they're going to come and take your assets, mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. even including your house, your car, everything. So, so where's the sharing of risk in that? The bank is not actually doing anything to help you in terms of your business. They're putting up some capital, usually at very high rates of interest, 
you know, which is a very high tax for your company to bear. Wouldn't it be better if you have people sharing risk and sharing capital in business ventures? Th this is the way to do it. You know, so this is the type of business partnership type arrangements which are, are prevalent in an Islamic society, which are, 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 are characterized by a sharing of risk between all the parties. So, you know, like Mufawada is probably the best example of that. Brother, uh, so, sorry, Brother Jamal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I know you, you want to go on, but uh, let me, yeah. uh, Brother Shahadat wants to come in. Yeah, so I think, I think really the best way to sort of answer a lot of these questions is, um, and just I just want to go back to this idea of the boom and bust cycle. Yeah. Fundamentally, what the boom and bust cycle is actually, it's a debt cycle. This is what it is. So the idea is that, at a, you start off at a, at a certain point where the debt levels, mm -hmm. aggregate debt levels in society are low. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is slowly over time, the debt levels begin to ramp up as the banks begin to loan, to lend more and more money into society. Now, obviously, it's in the interest of the banks to lend more money. Why? Yeah. Because it's their primary source of yeah. revenue. The, yeah. the higher the debt levels, the more interest that they that they receive They'll in receive, return yeah. and therefore more, more profit that they generate mm -hmm. as a business. Mm -hmm. So over the period of the debt cycle, you, you'll have exponential growth mm -hmm. in the level of debt until eventually what will happen is you'll reach an optimum level a peak level of debt beyond which the society can't take on board any more debt D do you see mm -hmm. because beyond that point you're not going to be able to pay the interest you're not going to be able to pay the initial the the principal principal amount back and once you crossed over that optimum level you have a debt collapse. Where, where, where do you decide this optimum level? How, how do they come it, to that? It's just, so if you take the example of, of an individual, the point at which they can no longer afford to pay their mortgage mm -hmm. so payment, the earnings, that is the optimum level. They've yeah. cut down on food, so, they cut down on cars and all ex of this. Exactly, okay. all of those. So, so what happens the is... bare minimum. They're living on bare minimum. That's right. Okay. So, so the, boom, the boom cycle mm -hmm. is in effect debt accumulation. Mm -hmm. Now... For us, at this time, ordinary people think things are good at this time because what's happening, all of this extra money that's being created, ultimately is going into assets and commodities. So people so are spending. Exactly. Yeah. So it's driving up the price of hu houses. Mm -hmm. So people are looking at the, at the price of houses saying, oh, you know, I'm wealthy. I've bought it for £300,000. All of a sudden, it's now £500,000. Mm. Um, the same is true of things like if you purchase gold, if you purchase, um, you know, any other commodity. The mm. fact that you're seeing this money that's being created going into these markets, which are boosting the asset prices, it creates this feel-good factor. And this is why people don't question, uh, question the economy at that time. Yeah. But then eventually what happens is because... You reach a peak level of debt, out, it has to collapse, it has to come down. And this is the bust phase. The bust phase is usually anywhere between six months to two years. But, but, and the yeah. idea is to re reset the system but, but, but so you can start I, I the think, cycle I think there's again. something wow. I'll add in there, which is that if we look at the amount of debt that we have, just for example, in, in the US, it's 350% of the size of the US economy. You know, of their total size of the economy, three and a half times the amount. You know, so that yeah. and and it's similar in the UK, if, if, not, the if not more. That's right. When you look at debt of the government, debt of businesses, and debt of individuals, three and a half times the size of that economy. And in in Japan, it's much worse than that. In the UK, it's very high as well. You know, these these are getting to levels where uh, unprecedented. Never seen them like that during war time. You name it. Never been as high as that. And that's why I think we've gone into a new phase where I think we're very unstable mm -hmm. and we could see a, a major crash. And, and this is the problem that we have. It may not just be one of these bust and boom type cycles. The politicians are always aware and they're trying to neutralize it because they want to keep themselves in office. They don't mm -hmm. want to lose out the, the next election. So this is why we see a massaging of all these figures and help with the banks and friendly legislation and you name it. So we're in quite a, a dangerous period of time. And I, and so I think the next how, how would you argue with those people that say, oh, this is all conspiracy theory or this is your understanding? This, this is, these because are everything, facts. Everything nothing, seems nothing, okay. Nothing, There's nothing some conspiracy about this at yeah. all. I mean, th these are, these are a debt figures which are available mm. out there if, if you mm. go search and and, and uh, look for them you'll see these levels of debt and you'll see that they've never been as high as this before mm. so mm. how is that going to be resolved you know there's going to be a crash or the value of that debt is going to be written off now how could it be written off it could be written off by inflating it away mm. you see meaning uh, the value what, what do you mean by inflating? well it if, if you owe a hundred thousand pounds mm -hmm. okay and 
you have to pay it back in 10 years time mm -hmm. and if there's zero inflation what you pay back in 10 years is, is effectively a hundred thousand pounds but let's say that there was 20 percent inflation every year wow. it means that the value of that hundred thousand pounds you still pay back a hundred thousand pounds you know in in 10 years mm -hmm. but what you'd be paying back it's, it's like paying back five thousand pounds after 10 years because the value of that hundred thousand is nothing mm. you know it's gone mm. so, low, so low yeah, yeah you yeah. see so this is what governments are doing and they change the way they work out inflation they've changed lots of so things do they go as yeah. they go along do they make rules or is there something that because you talked about the islamic mm. which we will uh, yeah. i want to discuss um uh, if time permits because i think we've we haven't even touched on a couple of things <laughs> but um do they just make up rules as they go along or yeah it uh, seems like that i mean mm. if i was to say that to someone and say oh you sure. just you uh, know, you pretty just much that's exactly what happened mm. so what you have you um you've got these central banking bodies and actually in terms of banking now the power really resides with the international uh, financial banks so the likes of the bank of international settlements the imf and and, uh, and the world bank and what basically they do to actually set up a bank is relatively easy all you need to have is um a certain amount of decent startup capital and, and the way it works with a conventional business, what you do, you utilize that startup capital to, you know, buy a lease on a, on a property, to, mm -hmm. to buy uh, some stock to, to put into your, into, into your inventory, to buy fixtures and fittings. With a bank, mm -hmm. what you do with your star startup capital is you keep it as a reserve. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. imagine you you have a hundred thousand pounds in reserve, and all you do you just sit on that capital. You don't do anything with it. You don't employ it in any in any way. Mm -hmm. But what that capital reserve allows you to do, according to the banking re regulations, is then to actually start issuing out loans. Mm -hmm. So you now, based on a, a capital reserve of a hundred thousand pound, can now potentially create loans of a million pounds. Mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. you see? Yeah. Because the capital reserve backs up. The, your 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 ability to create loans. So that relationship between the the total amount of loans you create and the capital reserves is known as the leverage ratio. So a, a million to a hundred thousand is a ten to one leverage ratio. Now the problem is that eventually if you start to incur losses on some of those loans yeah. so for example if you go back to the example of the house where you oh, borrowed yeah. mm. 300,000 pounds off me now if you f if you default on your mortgage i i seize your property i then sell it on the market to recoup my money but i don't get the full value of, of what you paid for it say i i only get back 200,000 pounds mm. so that's a 100,000 pound loss that i've made on that loan yeah yeah and in in essence my my capital reserve is what absorbs that loss do you mm -hmm, see? Mm -hmm. But now, me trying to absorb that loss, I've wiped out my capital reserves. At that point, I become insolvent as a bank. I can't function. And okay. this is where you need to be bailed out. So, so what regulations have basically done, it, it's made it really, really easy by minimizing the amount of capital reserves required by banks in order to create trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars worth of worth of loans so if you if you now look at the total global debt in the world i think it's approaching around about 250 trillion dollars mm -hmm. worth of debt mm -hmm. if you compare it to the to the G global gdp which i think is around about 75 trillion dollars now that the interest you pay on 225 trillion dollars it's got to come from the gdp so can you imagine, say 10% is what you're paying on interest on the global debt, which is around about $25 trillion. Wow. So $25 trillion of the interest has to come from the global GDP. Uh, and the more you ramp up debt, the bigger share you get of the, the global GDP. Do you GDP. know what? We, so I think we, we, we need another uh, another show for this. <laughs> um, uh, Brother Jamal, I was going to ask you about a cashless uh, society, but we'll, we'll, uh, I think we, we need to do a, a Pacific, we need to do just on cashless society. Um, but I want to discuss um, the Islamic economic system. Um, uh, it's, it's always praised. Um, but it fails to convince people of its practical existence. Uh, how do we move away from the capitalist model uh, as it affects every part of our life? Okay, uh, you know, the, I, I uh, thought you might be asking a bit about this. So, so earlier this afternoon, I went through and wrote down about 10 points mm -hmm. about what, you know, what is an Islamic economic system? You know, because people mm -hmm. often ask this question, so how would you describe it? So and it's praise, but I mean, how is it practical? I mean, well, it's that's, practical. That's it. Okay, it's practical because it worked for you know, 
1400 years 1300 years yeah. you know yeah. we saw since the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam right through until 1924 we saw Islam being applied yeah. and it had an economic system mm-hmm. uh, and that economic People system trade w- you, yeah it was bought, fair you yeah. know and and it was f- vibrant and it was it, it was a uh, you know, very successful, and, and alhamdulillah, people, Muslims, non-Muslims, you know, everyone knew it, they knew the laws, they knew the, 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 the position, they knew the currency, they traded, they knew, knew where they stood. So, you know, what was it that characterized that system as to why it was different from capitalism, and why was it so successful? Again, the, the main points, I, I thought I had 10 main points which I, I want just to talk about. Yeah, so, go for it. Yeah. Okay, number one, gold and silver as currency. So you've got something as, as money which is real, mm-hmm. okay? The if you got by something. That's right. If you've got paper money that's not backed by anything, governments are going to cheat. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're gonna not balance the books and they're going to print more and more money and that's what they've been doing since 1971 and it's getting out of control right now. Number two, non-interest economy you know we've been talking about interest all all night or riba yeah. you know usury yeah. this is uh you know as as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us you know th- those that touch riba cannot raise except for those that shaitan has has hit you know mm. or allah and the messenger will declare war against On those who deal yeah. in riba mm. you know it is a great crime and it, it permeates all society i look at it as a form of tax on everything you know, mm-hmm. so why do we want to have this tax? You know, which is slowing everyone down. So uh, Islamic economy, no interest whatsoever. Number three, non-hoarding of wealth. Again, Islam prohibits people from hoarding of wealth. So again, the circulation of wealth is a uh, is a, an imperative, so that it doesn't uh, you know circulate amongst the, the wealthy, um, and that creates a dynamic economy. So what do you mean by hoarding wealth? Is it can I not have a saving? No, you can have a saving, but you need to be saving for something. You okay. know, maybe you're saving to buy a car. Maybe yeah. you're saving to buy a house. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you're saving to start a business. But when you just have money for no reason, you know, you're but not the, doing... The, then you I know, will pay the car on that. Yes, you'll pay zakat on it whether you're saving for a house or not. You'll be paying zakat on it if you go over the, the nisab okay. value yeah. so it, it, and have it for more than a year. But you still, the principle is there is that if you have wealth, you need to be using the wealth. Okay. So this is why there's a motivation for people to invest, mm. to have businesses, you know, partnerships and so on and so forth. Mm. So it becomes very dynamic. You know, the money circulates. Um, number four, wealth-oriented tax. Okay, we have kharaj, we have usha, which is on the productive capacity of the land. We don't have business taxes. We don't have income taxes. We don't have, you know... Uh, fuel taxes, mm-hmm. council taxes, VAT, all these other things are a tremendous hit against people's ability to, to circulate the wealth and to, to use it. Uh, I'm, I'm whereas, whereas, here whereas I said, zakat is on, on, the youth that, uh, on the wealth that you're not using at 2.5%. Someone could argue that, look, without taxes, how does the country run? How does the society well, function? Well, there is a lot. There's a lot because when you put your, your tax based on kharaj and usher, this is on the land, it means the land will be used. And also, one of my points was that there would be um, land reform, which is basically use it or lose it. Because if you don't use land for three years, and it's agricultural land, Mm -hmm. the state will confiscate it. Mm -hmm. Again, so look at all the vast tracts of land in the UK, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, which which are not being used, mm-hmm. or which individuals use it, or large families or small families even Just are hoarding using those hoarding lands. those lands and not yeah. using it. So again, the state would say you're not using that. It's much more than you can use. It would take it back and give it to people that could use it. So again, and this means that the 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 utilization of land is very high, and then the tax, the kharaj and usher tax on the land becomes very high. So again, this is where the main form of taxes. Um, so again, that that's a a very distinct and unique way. The wealth-oriented zakat, mm-hmm. uh, again, is, is a large amount of money. And that, that goes into things like the poor, destitute, you know, those which are traveling and, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the categories mentioned in the Quran. Um, number five, uh, equity and partnership financing rather than debt-based financing. So, again, you've got the various company structures in Islam which encourage people to share risks and rewards and it's very distinctive we don't have this sort of the plc structure that we have in in capitalism which takes money and people abuse that system mm, mm. you know you and and you're not actually a partner in the company but you're a shareholder and and you're at the mercy of of the the directors to decide whether there's going to be a dividend or not it's 
Islam doesn't allow that. And related to that is point number six, which is no limited liability. You know, these big companies, they don't have limited liability. They got so when they go bust, that's it, finish. That's, right. well, they, that's right. They've got limited liability mm. based upon the capital that they put forward. Mm -hmm. And if they go bust, then, then you, lose, you lose out if, if you have a contract with them. So many people have been burnt by that. Whereas in Islam, you are a pledge for your obligations, which means that you cannot back down from the transactions that you commit to. So if I'm a company and you've invested and Shahadat invested and yep. after a while the company uh, makes losses and it's... It's, it's gone bust, and uh, I borrowed 10,000, and I borrowed well, 20,000. No, no, the, 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 pay back. The, 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 the partners in the business share the losses according to the capital they put up. Okay. The partners in the business share the profits in accordance to their agreement as to how that their agreement, uh, their their sh their um their company agreement is, is signed up, and that's important because if me and Shahadat put up the capital and we're quiet partners, we're not mm. and active, I'm doing the hard and work. you're doing the hard work, mm. we're going to take the loss, you know, because we're the ones who put the capital up. But equally, we will share the profits according to the, what the three of us agree Agreed. we're going to share them. Okay. Maybe you take 50%, maybe we take 50%. You know, it depends. But, but isn't that the but case with investment? So if I invest in a company um, and, you know, I do get the dividend, I do the get big, the... The big difference is that if you invest in a company, mm -hmm. you're not involved in the company. You know, mm -hmm. even if you're a big shareholder, you are not the company. Well, I do get the profit, though. I think. You will get dividends according to what the, the board of directors agrees. You could be a 10% shareholder, which is a big shareholder, mm -hmm. and, you're, and you've got no idea what, you, what, what uh, dividend you're going to get. You know, it's down to that company to, to determine, you know, the, the directors and, and uh, you know, major uh, shareholders will decide for the smaller shareholders, which means that you may miss out completely. Mm, and again, through accounting tricks, mm. you, they may decide not to uh, d declare a, div a dividend. You know, and equally, if if the company fails, mm. and many of them have failed, and they, and they've seen that empl senior employees have embezzled money out of the company, uh, again, the shareholder will get nothing, and he won't get any return on his capital. And and on top of that, they use these shares to gamble in stock markets. Mm. And you're not actually part of it. In Islam, you have to be a part of the company. This is there needs you, to be. Do you have to? There needs to be a will personality you be in, a, in, in the, the position company. of uh, making decision. Yes, you are. You're involved in the company. You you so are every decision. You that are you a make. partner. Yes, okay. the the, the mm. what, what they term shareholders in, in in Islamic companies. You are a partner in those companies. So, so you are actually a decision maker. Point number seven: We prohibit gambling. Yep. Okay, mm. all forms. Now, most Muslims know this. But they don't know is that a lot of the derivatives in the financial markets is gambling. It's not actually contracts, you know, swap agreements, you know, um, s certificates, uh, you know, CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. These are some of the problems which we had in the past, in the last financial crisis. They're all derivatives, which means that they're not contracts in terms of buying and selling and that we're both part of. They're contracts based upon other contracts and other measurements of, of way markets may move and which is like gambling you know mm. somebody gambles mm. on whether the horse in the five o'clock at ascot is going to win mm -hmm. he's not the horse mm -hmm. he's not the owner of the horse he's just gambling on whether the horse is going to do that the same thing i could have a, a, a an a, an agreement that if interest rates go to a certain level i get pay. paid somebody yep. else pays me you know, or if the stock market goes up to a certain level, I'm not the stock market. I'm not a participant in the market. People are gambling on where the stock market's going, and this, mm. or where the housing market is going. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a very corrupt thing because gambling upon gambling upon gambling has got out of control. So, so this is what the derivatives market is. The derivatives market, for your information, is about forty times the size of the overall economy. All right. Now, you could say that doesn't bother me because I'm mm. not part of it. Mm. I'm not mm. gambling. And in a gamble, there's a winner and a loser. But what say major banks are gambling and collapse? Then and all of a sudden, you wake, losers, up, yeah. you wake up on, on a, on a, on a, on a mm. Monday morning and the bank says, sorry, Kamal, I'm not going to give your bank card back. You yeah. know, because you, I can't, just you can't take the I money just, out. I just collapse. You know? I put my bank card in and, and I got nothing back. I didn't get my card back. I didn't get my money back. Why? Because the bank was gambling. And this happened in 2008. Mm -hmm. You would not have got your money back unless the government said, well, we're going to bail them out. 
right? And they bailed them out on very favourable terms for the banks. Mm, mm, mm. The banks and got we, out of that really. We saw that they were taking yeah. their uh, um, bonuses right yeah, after, after that's right. a couple still, of months. They still do. Now mm. let me finish very quickly because we're running out of time. Number eight: flexible labour markets, which means that your your wages could go up and they can go down, because mm -hmm. everyone today they're worried about deflation. They say, oh, things will go down. Well, we don't mind. If, if things go down, it's not the end of the world. You know, mm -hmm. so as long as uh, the economy is moving in a certain way and it's not within uh, major balances. Number nine, I mentioned land reform. Again, mm -hmm. use it or lose it. And that has had tremendous impact in terms of land utilization throughout Islamic history. So there's a great motivation for people to use the land if it's too much for them then it will go back to the state to, to reallocate. And last point, there's a very strict regulatory framework. In Islam, we have rules and laws which do not change every five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how, If you're a businessman, how can you function today when the laws are changing depending on which government it is in and who is exercising power over the government of the day? This is very, very corrupt system whereby the major funders of political parties is mm -hmm. major corporations. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, and the media has so much influence in society. Again, this is no conspiracy theory. This is what the reality is. And this is one reason why people are getting, people are getting more and more disillusioned with the politicians, not only in our countries, in the Muslim world, but here in the West as well. Can we just finish off with the gold standard in, yeah. in terms of how does it, the trading? So, for example, you know, is it just gold or is it commodity? How does it work? Um, it, gold, it's gold and silver. Uh, mm -hmm. The state, an Islamic state, and again, yeah. we don't have an Islamic state, we don't have a Khilafah today. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, this supposed IS business <laughs> is not a, a, okay. a, a not Islamic and is not mm -hmm. a state. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, is that under a proper Khilafah caliphate, uh, the, the, the currency will be gold and silver, which means that they will mint coins. Mm -hmm. uh, you could still have a bank account in which, you know, the, 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 the state treasury, the Beit al-Mal, will keep mm -hmm. gold in, mm -hmm. in reserve for you in, in, in vaults. Uh, they could issue paper money, but it has to be 100% backed by gold and silver. So how do we trade with a country well, like you, Germany, you, you could maybe, still, or USA? Yeah. They, it's not backed by uh, You can gold. trade in any currency on the world, yeah. you know, meaning that you can trade, because gold is accepted everywhere. You can buy gold now in dollars. You can buy mm -hmm. gold in pounds. You can buy gold in euros. So gold is always accepted everywhere. In fact, it is the most stable money ever in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. So there's never any problem with people taking gold for, for settlement of, of anything. So, so quite the opposite, in fact, we would be asking yeah. them to mm -hmm. pay us in gold and silver mm -hmm. for the oil, for example, that we, we send to them. We'll what say, if, we'll give you oil, we want you to give us gold. But uh, what if they don't have gold? I mean, how does it work? Well, they can, they, can go, they can go into the markets and they can go out and buy gold. I mean, it's like, it's like any other commodity. If they want to mm -hmm. buy oil, they can buy oil. But mm -hmm. we're not going to necessarily take a lot of cheap devaluing paper money <laughs> right mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you know we've got no control over how much money the governments print okay so shall that you want to yeah so j just to really um, highlight the importance of international trading currency specifically so at the moment you have um, a system um, where with international trade what you have is you've got um, the dollar which is the predominant trading currency in the world. So over 80%, so I think it's around about 85% of all international trade is conducted in, in the US dollar. Mm -hmm. Now, what that basically means is that the US is in a privileged position because the dollar becomes a commodity in its own right. It's something yeah. that's sought after by other nations because they need it. They buy in order, dollars, they, it? Yeah. they have to buy yeah. dollars in order to conduct trade. their trade. Yeah. Now, the problem becomes that... Um, if you look at the US, and this is true of all the Western economies, by the way, the majority of them are overwhelmingly service-based economies, which mm -hmm. basically means that their, their economy is purely is consumption-based. What's happening is you've got products, you've got goods and services which are being produced in the third world countries, the emerging countries. So China, the likes of Bangladesh, the likes China, of China, yeah. Indonesia, yeah. they're doing all the hard work. And then what happens is that... Um, Basically, the U.S. can simply pay for those things by just printing dollars. That's mm -hmm. it. So, again, there's an unfair unfair trade going on. Now, when 
you know, inshallah, when the Khilafah comes back, we'll put we'll put an end to that system. Because what we'll do, we'll stamp the the gold and silver monetary system of Islam on the world, so that we forced everybody onto onto our monetary system uh, and not the US. I think we we need to have another show just on uh, gold standard, how how it's traded. I think it, there's a lot of things we've missed out. I wanted to really discuss um, the cashless society. Uh, I know Jam- uh, uh, Jamal Howard, you've presented something on that, uh, which was quite interesting um i would really love uh, for you to come back uh, maybe another time yeah we'll come back another time um, definitely and yeah. and, and uh, go through that because okay. i i've missed that I've, I've got a lot of questions here which I've, I've just had to quickly skim through so i uh, really jazakallah khair uh, for brothers for taking your uh, time out to oh, come down um okay. uh, we'll have to end here inshallah this subject is very important for us uh, to understand and so much to take within an hour um but i hope you have been benefited from these discussions uh, i have definitely gained uh, so much alhamdulillah um so this doesn't end here you can carry on with the discussion on our twitter or if you have specific questions or need a bit more cl- clarity please do get in touch and maybe we can get brother jamal uh, to come uh, come in and inshallah he said he will come in for another show and uh, we can uh, we can answer your questions so do send your questions through um for the next show inshallah uh, thanks to the brothers for coming down inshallah jazakallah khair and a special thanks to all our listeners for listening and contributing to the show um, i really appreciate your comments and questions so do join in next week uh, again i'm sorry if i have not uh, take some of your uh, text Uh, I had I, I had so many so uh, I had to just pick randomly really um, you can follow us on Twitter which is at middle path radio again thank you for listening to middle path radio I hope you have a nice evening uh, till next Thursday assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alaikum assalam middle path radio your number one online islamic talk station